I want to start this conversation by talking about climate change. Now, climate change is the phrase that we used to refer to um, uh, to this um, phenomena. But now we call it climate crisis and global heating because climate change by itself does not portray the scale of emergency um, that we have. It's a single biggest threat. Uh, existential threat that um, humanity and the ecosystem has, is facing right now. Um, if you think about the history, we've had, um, if you look at the history of the planet Earth, we've had five um, global extinction events and a global extinction event means that about 90% of the species die out and we are currently facing the sixth extinction event. And the difference between the previous five and the sixth one is that this is the only extinction event that is driven by a species in the planet itself, which is us humans. Why is climate um, crisis the most significant? Because um, the current levels of carbon dioxide that we see in the planet is about 415 parts per million. And this is not something that we have seen in the past 800,000 years. Uh, the planet has seen this level of carbon dioxide, but by that time, um, the level, sea level was about 20 feet higher than what it is now. So, if you think about it, um, the, the simple fact that sea level rise that is, um, that is going to be the, you know, sea level is going to rise because the uh, ice sheets and glaciers are melting. And if you look at the level of sea level that is going to rise, if we continue in the current trajectory, uh, it will be about 20 feet higher at minimum and that will basically mean most of our country is going to be underwater. Um, so if you think about um, how the world is responding to the climate crisis, it's actually um, we, we've um, had a famous agreement, we call it the Paris Climate Agreement which was signed in 2015 which is trying to reverse um, this global heating by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we emit to the planet. So there are two sides to this work. One is mitigation which means we reduce the carbon dioxide that's emitted and the second one is adaptation because um, with the climate changing we have to adapt to the changing circumstances. Um, so I'm going to talk more about mitigation because that's one area that I've been working um, on a lot. So the Paris Agreement asks that we um, get to a level what we call net zero. That means no new carbon dioxide emissions in the planet by 2050. So any amount of carbon dioxide that we put onto the planet will be taken out um, through plants or something else. Um, now what is the reason that this Paris Agreement is important? Um, if we continue in the current way of living, the whole world, we will get to about 6 degrees Celsius um, on average more than what we had in pre-industrial times. The Paris Agreement target is to reduce this to 1.5 degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial time. Um, so let's understand what the implications are. Even 1.5 degree temperature rise is very, very bad for a lot of animals in the planet as well as for humans. So. Um, the survival possibility of coral reefs, which we have some, we, we've lost quite a lot of coral reefs that we had, survival possibility of coral reefs under 1.5 degree scenario is only 3%. So it's quite likely even under 1.5 degree scenario, all the coral reefs of this world in the tropical coral reefs will die out. Um, and the implication of that is because about 60% of all marine species spend at least part of their life in a coral reef that's going to have huge impact to their um, um, lives and lifestyles. Now let's talk about, you know, th this is a doom and gloom scenario, but the world has come together and try to solve this problem by rapidly reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we emit to the, onto the planet. How do we emit carbon dioxide? Every time we burn fossil fuels, we emit carbon dioxide to the planet. Every time we cut trees and, and remove forest, we reduce the capability of the um, trees to remove carbon dioxide from the air. The 
main focus that I want to focus, uh, the main focus of my work is about how do we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide um, going into the planet through basically fossil fuel combustion, right. So, um, what we, uh, you know, the phrase that we use about that is decarbonization. So, you have to decarbonize all our energy systems. Now, how do we do that? What is our pathway to net zero? Now, unfortunately, Sri Lanka, we don't have a plan to decarbonize our energy systems, but other countries have done it and there's plenty of research. We have a good understanding on how to decarbonize. And the good news is that the technology that is needed to decarbonize our power systems is already available. It doesn't mean that new technology is not coming, but we can decarbonize our power systems even with the existing technology that we have. So there are, um, you know, um, few steps that we have to take as a country, as a community, as a civilization to decarbonize. So the first one is to improve energy efficiency. Now this is not very complicated um, uh, at a starting level because we all know LED lights are much more efficient in energy than conventional lights. We know inverter air conditioners, so inverter free fridges are more energy efficient than the conventional ones. Um, so likewise, even, um, uh, you know, we know induction stoves are the most efficient um, cooking systems in the, uh, in the world right now. So, so these technologies are there for domestic systems and there are more technology that is coming up for industrial systems. So energy efficiency can reduce quite a lot of energy required um, in our uh, systems. Then the next one is the transformation of our energy systems into renewable energy. How is this happening? So first thing is that electricity is the most easiest way to convert, um, you know, we, we have an electricity system that is quite a lot um, um, using fossil fuels, but we can move them all into renewable energy. Then the next one is a bit more complex because we have three other systems. One is transportation, one is domestic um, energy use, and the third one is industrial energy use. So we need to transform all of that as well. So there are two ways to do that. One is we can convert quite a lot of these energy requirements into electric systems and then power it by renewable electricity. So how do we do that? Um, for transportation, we know there are electric vehicles around. It's quite common. Um, we have the Leaf, the Tesla and quite a lot of others um, already in the market. Almost all um, vehicle manufacturers have electric cars and in a lot of countries, the current um, internal combustion engine, this is the one that burns petrol or diesel, will not exist beyond 2030 or 2035 because they will be banned. So um, we can transport, trans, uh, we can change our current uh, petrol and diesel vehicles into electric vehicles. Um, the train systems can run on electricity, even the trucks can run on electricity. Um, the challenge is the larger vehicles such as the ships and airplanes, but I'll talk to that about that now, uh, later. Um, in domestic use, the, mo the significant one is cooking. Um, and as I mentioned, we have induction stoves that can, um, that is the most efficient way of cooking. Um, so that can move the, um, remove the gas used to electric and then we can power it by renewable electricity. Uh, similar things can be done by, done for also industrial thermal needs. Now even after doing all of that, there are some things that we cannot just convert to electricity. And for that, there is a new technology that's coming which is called green hydrogen. And how do we make green hydrogen? We use renewable electricity to break water molecules into water and hydrogen and oxygen and then we can burn the hydrogen to con create energy. So that's 100% renewable. So the difficult conversion such as say for example if you have a cement factory it needs a lot of heat they will use green hydrogen. If you have a steel factory there's already things called green steel which is made using green hydrogen. And even the ships and uh, airplanes can also move into green hydrogen so that they also run on renewable energy. Now let's think about Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka's electricity system. Um, our history was quite good because we started from 100% renewable electricity in the beginning. 
um, but right now our electrical system only has about 35 percent renewable electricity balance 65 percent is coming from coal and oil okay and now the um, utility CEB is talking about gas now none of these things exist in Sri Lanka we have to import them and this has created a huge problem both in terms of price as well as affordability so you know we are having power cuts now the reason for these power cuts is not that we don't have enough power plants but we don't have enough dollars to buy fuel for these power plants to power our electricity um, what do we mean by renewable uh, electricity so there are four main sources of renewable electricity one is um, hydropower we have our large reservoirs and then we have mini hydro reservoirs that are done by uh, uh, small companies um, we have solar which is using the power of the sun we have wind and we have biomass which is using um, fuel wood for generating power now the the best news that we can say is that Sri Lanka has abundant um, uh, potential to develop all of them um, in terms of hydro we have developed most of it um, but we have enough and more scrubland which can be converted into fuel wood plantations uh, we have significant amount of solar and wind potential being a tropical country and being an island um, if you think about solar um, you know we have very little you know we have about 700 megawatts of um, uh, rooftop solar currently installed uh, if you think about a country like Australia which has similar num you know very similar population uh, I believe their current number is about 17 gigawatts so you can see just by using the roof space so that you don't have to you know have land use challenges we can rapidly scale our um, solar systems um, if you want to go for large scale systems we can um, use the water bodies such as lakes and reservoirs um, and we calculated that if you use 25 largest reservoirs and 30 largest lagoons and cover them about 10 to 15 percent of their surface area um, we can get about 35 gigawatts um, if you look at wind we have about 30 gigawatt um, capacity on land and about 35 gigawatts use, usable capacity offshore wind um, and Sri Lanka is also a very good location for offshore wind because if you take the area between Mana and um, Jaffna um, the ocean is quite shallow so we can actually mount the large offshore um, wind turbines on ground rather than having it floating and it, it generates a lot more um, energy than uh, systems that are mounted on the ground so you know so we, we don't have a shortage of potential um, but we just don't have sufficient will to make this happen um, some people ask okay can we really run um, uh, with renewable electricity because you know sometimes there is variations of wind variations in solar um, and also we don't get solar during the night um, all of these problems have been successfully and commercially viable mechan you know, solved successfully and in commercially viable mechanisms globally um, so for example one of the good things we have is that we have um, hydro wind and solar all three um, which is a luxury because most places in the world will have either one or two of them but don't have all three and you look at our systems our wind and hydro actually were complementary to solar so when you know during the rainy days we'll have wind power and um, hydropower we will have less solar but during the dry period we have lots of solar and um, as for the evening uh, battery storage technology is quite advanced now and it's used very heavily in all over the world um, and we can store our excess energy during daytime and use it in the night now one might ask what is the you know why, why should we do that in addition to the um, decarbonization needs and you know the fact that whole human civilization and our ecosystems depend on it why would you do that and you know the current crisis that we are having for electricity um, actually tells us um, a, another reason if you want more on why we should do that the first thing is that if you go for this type of system you know fully renewable energy driven um, we will be able to assure energy security for the country okay not all the countries can do that and this is um, one of the great things about this country is that we can actually do that um, 
what are the two issues related to energy um, security that can be supported by renewable energy uh, so if you look at the um, we don't have energy security now um, because we know we don't have enough um, fuel for our vehicles we have a quota system 20 liters per week um, and even electricity we have power cut so we have a supply shortage so and that supply shortage is purely an issue of having to import fossil fuels. So if we had a lot more electric vehicles and if we had a lot more renewable electricity, then both solutions, uh, both problems would not be there. And there's some people in this country who thought about these things earlier and they bought um, electric vehicles so they don't have to wait in fuel uh, um, lines. Uh, they have solar systems on their roofs and now they have battery systems also so that they don't actually um, have any power cuts. Um, while that type of initiative is important and we should promote that, um, the real energy security comes when the whole energy grid transforms like that so that that benefit of not having power cuts is shared across the country not just the people who can afford uh, solar and batteries and also by moving the transportation systems we can give people um, sufficient mobility in the country without worrying about foreign exchange and fuel accessibility. The second benefit is actually cost and affordability issue so we know um, because of the economic crisis as well as because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the fossil fuel prices have increased as well as our rupee has depreciation and that has created a huge affordability crisis for people. Um, in August last year, we had electricity prices going up by 65% and in um, January, CEB has again proposed now another 70% increase. So that means, you know, within a period of um, six months, our electricity costs are going up by 200%. Now, a lot of people in the country will not be able to afford electricity and we have something called energy poverty. We will have more and more people uh, suffering from energy uh, poverty. But we have to understand this price increase is purely coming out of um, imported fossil fuel. Okay, This 200% increase is 100% attributed to the fossil fuel price increase. Um, as I mentioned before, we have 65% of our electricity coming from fossil fuels and that 65% accounts for 90% of the total generation cost. 35% of renewable energy only accounts for 10% of the generation cost. That tells us uh, what has happened. So the only way to solve the affordability issue is to de-risk our electricity and energy systems from imported fossil fuels by rapidly scaling renewable electricity in the grid. Um, and um, one thing that we can uh, also be proud of is that Sri Lanka has also started a, a green hydrogen pilot project um, and if we sufficiently scale our renewable energy capacity, we can also generate green hydrogen. There are already demands for green hydrogen in the world. Germany is buying, if you look at European Union, they have a target for 2030 certain amount of green hydrogen will be made inside the European Union and they will import certain amount of green hydrogen. So if we move fast enough and get our act together, we can actually move from being an um, import of fossil fuel to export of green energy either as electricity or as green hydrogen. So that is a complete paradigm shift to where we are. We are, we are moving from a dependency towards self-sufficiency and excess so that we can make it as a revenue and dollar earning um, industry for Sri Lanka. Um, I mean, in conclusion, um, what I have to say is that this decarbonization of energy systems is happening all over the world. Um, it's happening at a rate too slow for it to really make a difference for uh, uh, climate crisis. Um, but there is ample opportunity for us to fast track and in a country like Sri Lanka where we are really dependent on imported fossil fuels, if we fast track this transition, we will be much more sustainable than we are. We will ensure that our energy needs are affordable and available um, as well as the whole transformation will be economical, beneficial for Sri Lanka um, as well as uh, uh, having ability for us to um, uh, earn 
foreign exchange through exports. Um, it's a necessary transformation. Um, there are some positive steps that are taken by the government, but we have the ability to fast track this transformation and contribute directly to the prosperity of the country. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you to making this um, ambition true. Thank you.